Good morning. Uh, I'm Mark Schlissel, president of the University of Michigan, and it's a pleasure to welcome everyone to this very special event, America's Mayors on Crisis and Change. This conversation is part of the Democracy and Debate theme semester that stretches across our campus with multiple learning and teaching opportunities around democratic engagement. I'd like to applaud the faculty, students, and staff who created the theme semester. They're carrying forward the mission of our great public university. I also thank the mayors who've joined us today, whom Dean Massey will introduce more formally in a few minutes, and a special shout out to University of Michigan alumna, Maya Lori Lightfoot, who will be joining us. Uh, the US Conference of Mayors has said that American cities and their metropolitan regions remain the greatest laboratories for democracy and policy in the world. It's an honor for us to be able to learn from the leaders who are running four of these great laboratories as they confront challenges locally that have been captured, that have captured our national conscious. Policing, social justice, systemic racism, and income and health inequality, to name just a few. This type of learning is precisely what our community envisioned with the theme semester. It provides a catalyst for cross-campus collaboration, in this case, between our Talman College of Architecture and Urban Planning and our Poverty Solutions Initiative. Even without the presidential debate we had planned to host before the pandemic, we can be very proud that our engagement in important issues continues. 19 days from now, October 19th, is the state of Michigan's deadline for registering online, by mail, or at a branch office. After that, all applications must be submitted to your local city or township clerk's office in person in order to be eligible to vote. Election day, of course, is November 3rd. Today and throughout the semester, we're thrilled that we can advance important values of democracy and debate and make their examination available digitally to all. So thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our event moderator, the Dean of the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, Jonathan Massey. Hello everyone, and thank you, President Schlissel. And thanks also to the team that pulled this event together, especially Katie Cole, Trevor Bechtel, and Carl Cole. We're gathered here, as you just heard from our president, under the auspices of our theme semester on democracy and debate. And uh, this is a, an event that's keyed to the election season. And of course, last night, all eyes were on the presidential candidates in a debate that triggered associations with crisis, chaos, and trauma, honestly. Um, and certainly the chief executive is the biggest contest contest in at stake in these elections in November. But government operates at multiple scales and the key issues in national politics play out with particular intensity in our cities where executive leadership comes from mayors. This year has tested mayoral leadership like no other. The COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting economic crisis have put an extraordinary strain on our cities and communities posing new challenges and opportunities for our elected officials. The movement for racial justice has often focused on mayors in its pursuit of accountability for police violence and the right to protest and assemble. This contest has, context has forced mayoral leaders to respond even more quickly than usual amid rapidly changing events. But our cities are also essential forums for addressing long-term issues such as climate change, social equity, economic opportunity, and structural racism. That's why Taubman College partnered with President Schlissel's Poverty Solutions Initiative to consider how some of our nation's di most dynamic mayors are addressing some of these matters of core concern, not just for this election season, but also for our collective future. Our colleagues here at the University of Michigan work with city leadership all over the state and the country in, in various ways, including, of course, Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan and Ann Arbor Mayor Christopher Taylor. Today though, we've invited four civic leaders from beyond our state who are advancing big picture agendas while also responding tactically to emergent crises. I will say a little bit about um, our four mayors uh, and then we'll invite them in and uh, turn to questions. Jacob Fry came to politics through his law practice and community advocacy. After four years on the city council, he was elected mayor of Minneapolis, Minnesota, with a population of 425,000. 
in 2017. He has focused on affordable housing, zoning reform, inclusive economic growth, and also police accountability, a priority before and since Minneapolis police officers killed George Floyd back in May. Lori Lightfoot, who graduated from the University of Michigan, as you heard, with a degree in political science, is also an attorney with a record in both private practice and public service. She was president of the Chicago Police Board and chair of the city's Police Accountability Task Force, among other roles, before winning election last year as the first African-American woman to lead the city, population 2.7 million, and Chicago's first LGBT mayor. She has prioritized ethics and government reform, worker protection, and the city's financial sustainability. Libby Schaff, also an attorney, worked in city government in her home city of Oakland, California, population 429,000, before joining the city council in 2010. Elected mayor in 2014 and again four years later, she has prioritized affordable housing and other solutions to homelessness, along with educational opportunity and equitable transportation. And finally, Michael Tubbs is not a lawyer. He was elected to the city council of Stockton, California, population 311,000, in 2012, right out of his master's degree. And he subsequently formed a public-private venture to eradicate intergenerational poverty. When he took office as mayor five years later, he became Stockton's first African-American mayor and the youngest mayor of any major city in America. His priorities have expanded from poverty reduction to include educational opportunity and gun violence prevention. So welcome all four of you. Thanks for joining us today. It's, it's really wonderful to have you here. Um, a word for the audience, I will start the discussion by asking our panelists to address some of the biggest topics in our cities today, then we'll bring in the audience. Viewers, please use the YouTube chat box to pose questions for any or all of our guests. My colleagues will be collating those and pulling from them for the, for the latter half of the panel, and you see some instructions here on screen now. We will bring those back. Uh, when we turn to audience questions. <clears throat> so I'm gonna kick things off by talking about universal basic income. This is the idea of universal basic income or UBI, an unconditional periodic payment from government to its citizens, gained visibility in the US through Andrew Yang's presidential candidacy and then even more this spring and summer through federal economic impact payments and expanded unemployment insurance. Mayor Tubbs, you've been out in the lead on this issue creating what I believe is the first city-based UBI program in the nation, the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration. You've expanded your focus and created Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, a group that you too have joined, Mayor Schaff. So for the two of you, Mayors Tubbs and Schaff, how did the crisis and the pandemic change, reaffirm, or otherwise modify your convictions about UBI that you held before this spring? Uh, well, want me to start, Libby? All right, Mr. Dean, and to the other mayors on the panel, pleasure to be with you, albeit virtually, and to the University of Michigan. Thanks so much for having me. Um, well, let me start with um, how I learned about basic income. So I think a lot of talk is around sort of Andrew Yang or Mark Zuckerberg and other folks who in the last couple of years have talked about basic income. But I learned about it studying Dr. King. Um, in 1967, he wrote his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos Our Community. And at that time, it was a time of great civil unrest in this country. There were over 200 protests against racial injustice, against the violence of poverty in this country in 1967. And Dr. King looked out and said, you know what? We solve poverty for everything. We try to solve for poverty with everything but cash. And he said, I'm now convinced that the simplest way to abolish poverty and economic security is the most direct. And it's sort of from those words is where the stock the economic empowerment demonstration comes from, which we launched in October of 2017. And this pandemic has really illustrated what we knew before the pandemic, that A, that economic insecurity and scarcity is a choice. It's a choice not of individual actors, but it's a policy choice. It's something that we allow as a society. And then number two, COVID-19 has also illustrated, illustrated excuse me, just how the economy has not been working for working people. When you have essential workers who are told to shelter in place, but don't have paid time off if they're sick. We have essential workers who are putting their health on the line and then still have to wait in line for food banks um, after work to get food. It suggests that, 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 that something's wrong. So I think COVID-19 
and the racial unrest and, and the pro, not ra- civil unrest around racial injustice really um, put in focus for me the need to have a solution that may feel a little bit radical, feel a little bit scary, but it's much more calming, in my opinion, than the status quo. And that so COVID-19 has really made guaranteed income something I went from being very interested in and kind of patiently waiting to the results of our evaluation to saying that the data is clear in terms of how my constituents are living now, that everyone deserves an economic floor and it's a policy that the United States has to adopt um, immediately because people are really suffering, particularly during this time. And I'll just add, and just I'm so grateful to Mayor Tubbs's leadership and starting Mayors for Guaranteed Income. It's it's this network is powerful, and we are not going to stop until we get policy change at the federal level. And what's been, you know, I I, I keep on pressing uh, the city workers in Oakland to find the silver linings in this pandemic. And I believe that the the silver lining in in all this suffering and tragedy has been the clarity, the the wake up call. And we've seen how uh, you don't have to (laughs) just be a, a, a motivated person to be earning enough money to take care of your family right now. Things can happen that uh, necessitate government intervention. And and let's be clear, we are advocating for guaranteed income, which is targeted for those who live below a certain income floor, which is different from basic income, which believes everybody gets the same payment regardless of what their income status is. We've seen with that direct cash payment from the government that people want this and it works. It's like the people's stimulus. (laughs) And we know from the work that Stockton is doing and their evaluation that people spend this unconditional cash on on basic needs, on rent, food, utility bills, medicine. Uh, This is, in fact, sometimes people take this little extra pillow so that they can quit the third job that they're having and look to upgrade their skills or look for a better paying job. Uh, we've seen that that this extra cushion actually motivates people to move up the economic ladder. And so that's why in Oakland, we're uh, excited about this, not just as a way to end poverty, but also as a way to address racial disparities. In Oakland, African-American families are three times more likely to live in poverty. The median income for white families is three times that of Black and Latino families in this city. And what more direct and dignified way to start addressing those disparities than unconditional cash? And I'll, I'll leave with this idea. Government is often so stupid and inefficient. I call it tweezer government. Uh, Mayor Carter was giving an example of uh, raising his his baby girl uh, with WIC benefits, but his baby girl had nut allergies and a dairy allergy. He could get unlimited supplies from WIC of peanut butter, milk, and cheese, uh, but no almond butter, nothing that his baby could actually consume. Uh, I gave another example. We have something called Keep Oakland Housed, where we give emergency cash for people that are about to lose their housing. And in one case, a family where the breadwinner was a development, developmentally disabled adult, uh, he had actually lost his income because the washing machine at their house broke and he could not navigate a public laundromat to keep his work uniform clean. So not only did he use the cash to pay off the back rent, but to also buy a new washing machine so that he could stay employed. I don't think there are any governmental programs to buy washing machines. So we in government cannot be so condescending. We need to give people the dignity and the hand up to get them on that economic mobility ladder. Thank you both. Mayor Lightfoot, in February, you launched an anti-poverty initiative that doesn't employ the direct cash transfer method. What approaches are you taking um, instead and why? Well, we've done a number of things even before um, the February um, uh, poverty summit that we had, which was the first of its kind um, in Chicago. 
We know that if we don't lift people up out of poverty, that we're going to continue to suffer overall as a city. So the clarion call that we issued was to really prick people's consciousness about the fact that there are people living in our city right now, <clears throat> great global city that we are, who simply don't have access to the basics. And we define poverty really as the absence of, the absence of jobs, the absence of uh, access to good quality health care, the absence of housing, and really fundamentally the absence of hope that they have the same opportunities to um, fulfill their God-given talents as anyone else. So what have we done to start to address these issues? Number one, and we looked at what we were doing as a city government to lay unnecessary burdens on the lives of our residents. And where we started last year was looking at our fines and fees regime. And by that I mean, we were literally driving people into bankruptcy because of non-moving violations, tickets. We took people's cars, we took their driver's licenses, so we took their ability to be mobile, to be able to get to their jobs, and we drove them into bankruptcy. In Chicago, when people filed for individual bankruptcies, one of the highest reasons that they cited was debt to the city of Chicago. Hmm. We believe that that was shameful. So we completely dismantled that regressive regime and stopped sending people into bankruptcy, giving them the opportunity uh, to either completely get rid of their prior debt or to get on payments plans that were actually realistic. We were also taking people's cars at an outrageous um, rate. We, we totally reformed that process. One of the things I think I'm most proud of is uh, we were shutting people off from access to water because they fell behind in their water bills. Now think about that. Water is a basic human right. And if anybody who's ever had their water shut off for even a matter of hours, let alone days or weeks or months, you know what an incredible inconvenience that is. We stopped that actually even before I took the oath of office during my transition. And what we've done is we've instituted a new program where if people have pre-existing water or sewer debt, we allow them to customize a payment plan that, that fits with what their budget is. And if they make those payments consistently for a year, their prior debt is gone. So those are some of the steps that we've taken. And of course, we've invested more in affordable housing and workforce development and mental health services, all the things that cities all over the country are doing. But we really looked at what we as a city government was doing to push people into poverty and not allowing them an opportunity to, as Libby said, a hand up and on a better trajectory up for their future. So those are some of the things. And let me also just say this, um, in addition to saying, go blue. I want to say that the university, several years back, really started this program thinking about poverty. One of the most important things that we can do, I think, as leaders, is actually talk about poverty. Talk about how it is ravaging our neighborhoods, robbing people of hope and talent. We don't do that. And that just the mere fact that we are talking about these issues, that we are focusing policies on eradicating poverty and using the tools of great universities like the University of Michigan, who has partnered with us um, on our plan uh, to eradicate poverty, makes a huge difference in our thinking as leaders and as city government and really bringing focus to one of the most pressing issues of our time. Why do we have gun violence in cities like Chicago? Poverty. Why do we have an exodus of people from cities like Chicago? Poverty. Why are we seeing COVID-19 exacerbate the differences in life expectancy and healthcare gaps in black and brown neighborhoods? Poverty. It all relates back to the same thing. Thank you. Um, shifting gears a little bit and and turning to another topic and bringing in Mayor Fry as well. Um, one of the toughest challenges frequently faced by progressive mayors is finding yourselves caught between constituents protesting police brutality and police forces that resist accountability and change. 
I know that's an oversimplification and there are many more complicated uh, dynamics, but this is, we, we've seen a lot of this, um, including protests against police killings that erupted in many cities this summer, including Minneapolis and Chicago. So as we saw in recent months, governors and the president sometimes step in and supersede municipal authority. So, so Mayor Fry and Mayor Lightfoot, how can we sustain the right to public assembly in our cities when it is curtailed by the police and sometimes also by state and federal armed forces? Um, Jacob, why don't you go first? <laughs> uh, well, first off, a big thank you. Uh, thank you to Jonathan, the University of, of Michigan. Uh, thank you to all the mayors that are on here with me right now. You know, cities and, and mayors are very much in this laboratory of democracy right now. Uh, and it's an honor just to spend time with, with people that are truly thinking beyond the status quo in a big way. You know, I, I, I love the old quote that is that, you know, good mayors borrow uh, from other mayors, great mayors steal. And, uh, you know, most definitely I'm going to be copying a lot of the work that you guys are doing because it's impressive. Uh, now, with respect to the question, I think it is incumbent on, on mayors, on public servants, on all of us throughout the country to be ardent defenders of, of our First Amendment. We need to make sure that people have the ability to protest peacefully. Now, simultaneously, uh, that right, that freedom of expression, it stops at the next person's nose. Now, every one of these circumstances are different. Uh, the protests in Minneapolis uh, diverge from the protests that may take place a month later or that in Chicago or in, or in other parts of the country. Uh, and, you know, is there a unified formula for handling these situations? No, there's not. Uh, but we need to be honest and transparent about it. We also need to be clear. Uh, you know, our uh, city has made sure to support peaceful protests as they take place. Um, during times of COVID-19, we've gone so far as to say, all right, we're going to issue masks so that people who want to protest the tragic and horrible killing of George Floyd can do so in a healthful manner. Uh, and simultaneously, you also need to make clear that unrest that is leading to burning and uh, the, the wrecking of our small businesses and our commercial corridors, it is entirely and absolutely unacceptable. Those two pieces are not mutually exclusive positions to hold. Uh, in fact, First Amendment speech requires that people are safe and that others, others' rights are protected as well. And so that's something that I think mayors throughout the country have, have been dealing with. And there are so many instances when the most difficult decisions land on our laps. Some of the most controversial decisions land with us. Uh, and, you know, my stance, my tact has been, look, be honest, be clear. Uh, yes, you're going to have probably a whole lot of people that are upset from all different angles of the spectrum. And in many cases, that probably means you're doing your job. I'll also like to highlight something else that goes beyond the unrest, but is a First Amendment dynamic that I believe that mayors are going to be dealing with consistently in the future. So we have an obligation uh, under the law, under the Constitution, to not just protect people's First Amendment rights, but to provide the necessary safety and city infrastructure when some form of speech comes to town that may trigger uh, a pushback. Now, the example that has been used probably over the last year more often than not is the president comes to town. So Trump comes to town and you have a whole lot of people that are frustrated by his speech or his presence. And under the First Amendment, of course, it's our obligation to protect that speech. However, the issues that cities around the country are experiencing is that when the president or, or it could be anyone comes to town and then we're forced to provide the necessary safety infrastructure that could cost, you know, five hundred thousand dollars. It could cost a million dollars just for one event. Now, that's something that cities are going to have a really tough time if we are required to continuously support and then pay for as well. Now, 
In the future, this may not be Trump, this may be somebody else, but the underlying dynamic, it remains. And I think the message coming from mayors around the country is we want to support First Amendment rights, regardless of whether or not we agree with the underlying speech. But doing so is getting really expensive. And we need to be looking out right now, especially during times of these multiple crises that are stacked on top of one another. It's our obligation. I think it's our foremost obligation to protect those that are most in need with with these basic services, whether that's food or shelter or housing uh, or GBI. Uh, You know, these are things that we need to be doing. And if we're spending tons of money on barriers and and cops just to protect this one single event, we have less money for other things. And I think that's something that we all can kind of be united on uh, because it's a dynamic that we're going to need to fix and solve. Thank you, Mayor Lightfoot. Um, well, I think Mayor Fry really has, I think, set the table well uh, for your question. Uh, there's no doubt, as you've seen played out, not just in Minneapolis or Portland, but really all across the country and at various times, but also simultaneously, mayors uh, have really, and cities really have been challenged uh, by, I think, the tension uh, that Jacob has really um, defined. On the one hand, obviously, the First Amendment is sacrosanct, full stop. All of us understand that. All of us agree and embrace the sanctity of First Amendment speech and right to assembly. Um, And I will have to push back a little bit on the premise of your question that First Amendment is actively curtailed by police forces. That is not the experience I'm here in Chicago. And frankly, it's not the mandate of my administration or our police superintendent. We have talked extensively about why it's so important that we protect uh, peaceful protests, that we protect a peaceful right to uh, First Amendment expression and right to assembly. And in fact, we have stood up a unit within the police department that is well-trained in First Amendment protection, um, that is well-trained in de-escalation and uh, crisis intervention. Unfortunately, the dynamic that we've seen um, over the course of this summer <clears throat> is, is threefold. Number one, peaceful protests. We all agree that that should be protected. But what we've also seen, number two, is groups that embed themselves in peaceful protests who have a completely different uh, mindset when it comes to protests and being out on the street. You know, I'm almost, almost 60 years old. I have been in the streets marching and protesting on a range of different issues over my adult life. But it never had it occurred to me to bring a bat, a tire iron, a shovel, a hammer, um, water bottles uh, that are frozen, filled with urine, uh, or fireworks to a protest. And yet that's what we're seeing, unfortunately, on a regular basis, not only in Chicago, but in in, in cities across the country. And these people that come armed for a fight are bringing their own videographers to record and really incite um, conflict with police departments. That's a whole different animal than peaceful protest. The third thing element that we've seen is not only <clears throat> peaceful protests and what I'll call vigilantes who come armed for a fight, but what we've also seen in Chicago and in other cities is people want to take advantage of that moment and what they think is vulnerability or distraction to loot our shopping and commercial areas to steal the dreams of our small business owners. And so we are really managing all of those dynamics at the same time. And now, anytime there's a protest, we've got to be ready for the worst case scenario. And as Jacob says, when you've got to gear up for the worst case scenario, that is the diversion of resources that could be better spent on other more productive ways of keeping our people and our neighborhoods safe. So it is a very challenging time to be a big city mayor. It's a very challenging time to navigate all of these dynamics that typically are happening simultaneously and figure out how, both in terms of resource allocation, but also in communication, you get, um, you communicate effectively that you're there to support and encourage peaceful protests, but you have to protect people. And as I've said many times, over the course of our summer, our residents have a right to expect and to be able to live their lives in safety. Our businesses have a right to expect that they and their employees and their property 
will be protected and be safe. And our police officers have a right to be protected against um, attacks on them. Just in Chicago alone, over the course of this summer, we've had so many police officers with broken limbs, lost eyes, um, and other injuries as a result of the fight that has been brought to them by vigilantes. And in Chicago, we've had over 60 police officers who have been shot at by residents. We are living in a difficult and challenging time. And so when we talk about these issues, we've got to talk about it with the full understanding of the context and think about it holistically on how we work to move in a different direction, a more peaceful direction, um, but doing it with respect for all. Thank you. Um, I'm going to expand the frame a little bit and think about, you know, po policing obviously is is unevenly distributed in the space of our cities. Um, and uh, it that is one of the legacies of white supremacy that disproportionately affect black families. Another example is wealth disparity rooted in the history of home ownership, housing discrimination, racial covenants, and redlining, stuff that those of us in architecture and urban planning focus on quite a bit. These mechanisms of spatial segregation have also contributed to some of the other inequalities that surface in our conversations, in education, in health, in other aspects of life. In, in our fields, we see spatial justice as an integral dimension of racial justice. And so for, for all four of you, I would love to hear what measures you're taking to dismantle the elements of white supremacy that are built into the geography and physical fabric of your cities? Well, I'll start out on this one. Uh, it's, for, it's first important to recognize the history from, from which we've come. Uh, and I think Minneapolis is not necessarily unique in this, but we have a very long history of intentional segregation, of restrictive covenants that run with the land, of redlining, uh, horrible financing practices, and very intentionally excluding communities of color uh, and at times Jews from the rest of the city. We literally have maps at City Hall dating back 80, 100 years that define North Minneapolis as a slum for blacks and Jews. We've cut off access uh, to the riverfront for these communities. We've placed massive highways around this particular area of our city that inhibits access to everything from food to commerce to just the rest of the city as a whole. And that kind of intentional segregation has horrible impacts. This is one of the main and primary reasons that I uh, ran for office. And I think now it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that the precision of our solutions match the precision of the harm that was initially inflicted. And that harm was precise. Uh, and so there's a number of tools that we used. First, and, and I'll touch on this briefly, but it's really more related to the next question. We had a comprehensive plan. It was a 2040 comprehensive plan that got rid of single family exclusive zoning across the city. Uh, that particular zoning made it so that unless you had the ability to own a really big home on a really big parcel, you couldn't live in huge swaths of the city. It was just totally unaffordable. Uh, we've established a number of practices that allow for ownership. Ownership, as we know, is one of the best ways to generate intergenerational wealth. Uh, and so we're making sure to help to provide down payment assistance for uh, communities in some of these areas for our black and brown communities, but it's not just related to the ability to own a home. It's also the ability to own commercial property as well. People often forget about this. You know, it used to be, uh, you know, back in the fifties after the GI bill, which almost exclusively helped white families that, you know, you'd own your home, you'd have the, the, the down payment there, you'd set up the mortgage, you've had the white picket fence, and then you would even own your own business and you'd own the land underneath that business itself. Now what we see is some of the communities that have made these corridors wonderful to begin with get the boot because the, the prices get jacked up, rents go through the roof, and they can't afford to pay for the barbershop or the restaurant or the marketing firm. They can't afford that anymore, and so they get kicked out. So what we've done is we've set up what's called a commercial property development fund, and that helps to bridge the gaps 
um, that helps to provide that necessary patient capital so that these communities that have traditionally been excluded have the ability not just to have the business, but to own the underlying property. Uh, and yes, this will take time, but this concept of ownership and, and kind of financial independence, it can go a long way towards pushing back on some of the systemic inequities, on the systemic racism that we've seen in our city and that has been literally reduced and defined by a map. Uh, and so these are just a couple of examples of the area that are areas that we're working on. We're, we're all, we've also we're also just changing the way that we've done business at the city. You know, we used to talk about, well, everybody's got to be at the table. Well, yeah, that's true. Uh, but sometimes uh, we need to remove ourselves from the table. We need to say, you know what? Uh, we want not just to hear from our black and brown communities, but make sure that they are key beneficiaries of the work itself. And so what we've set up is the Minneapolis Forward Coalition, where they've created the eight overarching recommendations. I haven't edited, ed edited them even a little bit. Uh, and then we can proceed with the vision that I think is excellent, moving towards uh, a, a range of, of, of racial equity moves that I think are going to be essential for the long term. Thank you. I, Jonathan, I'd love to jump in on this. Um, you know, the first year I became mayor, we established a department of race and equity. And equity is a word that just gets thrown around a lot this year. But I just want to emphasize how it is a discipline. It requires analysis, data, qualitative interviews to find out from the people most impacted by disparate um, results what they believe has caused those uh, uh, disparities. And so uh, just some examples of how that commitment, which is infused throughout our organization, translates into the physical space, which I think is what you wanted us to focus on. And, and let me just start by saying, uh, Mayor Fry, we are all just like so grateful to you for really uh, leading with that elimination of single family zoning. Uh, we've been trying to get it done at the state level for times the legislation has died on the floor. So now we're just gonna have to do it uh, at the city level. But um, but an example of how we've used a race and equity analysis on physical uh, spaces. Uh, we've, we've looked at factors where your road conditions could have a disparate impact on you based on your income. You know, a, a flat tire or a broken axle is going to impact someone who is poor far more than someone who is wealthy. And so when we did recently our paving plan, our three-year paving plan, we actually created different factors that we used to analyze the impact of poor roads on different neighborhoods based on the people living there. And that's one of the things that we in government have got to do more of. We've got to do human-centered design. Stop thinking about, you know, pavement and budgets and start thinking about people. And so we actually are putting the vast majority of our paving, our repaving uh, resources. We're paving many more miles of roads in our low income neighborhoods. We looked at uh, percentages of children, seniors and disabled who are also disproportionately impacted by poor road conditions. And this year for the first time, we're also inviting communities to propose capital improvement projects. So instead of it coming from City Hall, it's coming from the neighborhoods. So both as far as giving voice to people in the neighborhoods as about what physically they want, but also allocating resources in some ways the opposite way that they used to be allocated. Um, the other example is uh, we recently were very successful in a big competitive grant called the Transformative Climate Communities. And it was years in the making because the community had some pretty kind of creative uh, ideas that the bureaucrats in City Hall thought were a little odd. They wanted to create an aquaponics farm in an old abandoned greenhouse. They wanted to have a bike share program that actually used bikes as art 
uh, they're called scraper bikes and they decorate all the wheels. It's something that literally came out of East Oakland. It's fabulous. But it wasn't the kind of stuff that, that bureaucrats normally would, you know, write grants for. But with time, with this new kind of philosophy that is infused really through the leadership of the Department of Race and Equity, uh, we step back, we let the community lead, and we just won a $28.3 million grant to implement this great vision from the residents of this particular community. So those are some ways that we've seen race and equity translate into physical spaces in Oakland. Mayor Bravo, Libby. Bravo. Yeah. Mayor Tubbs, do you have similar uh, strategies in Stockton or a different situation? Well, um, I, I, I mean, <laughs> Mayor Frey and Mayor Schaaf gave us a master class. So I have nothing. If I said anything, just repeating what they said. Um, but we're also lucky enough to get a $10 million grant in Stockton for the Transforming Climate Community that used the same sort of community-oriented design process to um, counter, counterbalance the effects of redlining with what we're calling in California greenlining, with, with investments that are green in terms of money, but also green in terms of building climate resiliency in our communities most impacted by kind of environmental injustice, which we know is also a function of planning and land, land use decisions. Great, thank you. Um, I'm happy to jump in. Yeah, please. So the, I think the challenge in thinking about spatial segregation is this. People love their neighborhoods and they don't want to move. You know, historically, going back to the um, 40s and 50s and early 60s, the idea about reversing segregation was to compel integration. Um, and in almost every instance that failed miserably. But we know that the dynamic is, is that when Black and brown communities are segregated. Their, their communities are always universally unequal. Unequal in resources, unequal to access. Um, and so that is a challenge. But as we have started to really try to think about how we undo literally decades of segregation, unfortunately, Chicago remains one of the most segregated uh, neighborhood, segregated cities in the country. We've gone to people in neighborhoods who haven't historically received resources and talked a lot in engagement around what we can do to co-curate a future that they want. And so we um, started with a program called Invest Southwest. And if you know Chicago, when you talk about the South Side, you talk about the West Side, you're talking about Black and Brown communities. And we have committed $750 million of city dollars, and we're drawing uh, private capital um, and focusing on commercial strips that literally have not seen a diamond investment in forever. And it's not just retail, but it's thinking holistically about how we create a different uh, living environment for businesses to thrive, for their customers to thrive. So of course we're talking about um, the, the built environment and we've done a lot of infrastructure uh, work in these communities. Of course, we're talking about affordable housing and we're also thinking creatively about building community spaces that are different, that are, ne that are needed as defined by what the community needs are. And in order to carry that forward and to provide technical assistance to these communities uh, where we're making these investments, we have uh, created uh, positions of community development officers in effect that uh, really serve at the will of local stakeholders, but funded by a city and philanthropy. And then we've redesigned our, uh, um, our planning department to make sure that we've got uh, people on the ground as planners that are devoted to areas of the city and they are literally embedded in those neighborhoods as well. We've also done a lot around um, <clears throat> affordable housing, of course. Um, and I should have said at the beginning, and then I hired the first ever, <clears throat> excuse me, chief equity officer for the city, uh, who spent a lot of time looking at racial divides, and again, looking at how city government has aggravated um, the uh, lack of equity in the way in which we've conducted our basic um, services across the city. So that has already paid dividends. 
We spent a lot of time recently thinking about a particular area of the city, it's the Woodlawn neighborhood, which will be in the shadow of the Obama Presidential Center and being very intentional about making sure that that um, development doesn't lead to displacement of long-term indigenous residents. And we've worked very hard over the course of a year, just got this passed through our city council to inject new resources to help those residents that cap um, how new housing rates and rental rates, but also provide long-term residents with resources um, to maintain their existing housing stock. And the last thing I, I will say we've done more is we recently announced a new program around transit-oriented development but we call it equitable uh, transit-oriented development because we've done transit-oriented development, but we've not been thoughtful about equity. And so for the first time, we're adding an equity component, an equity lens on transit-oriented development that will help keep people in their neighborhoods, uh, but do it in a way that allows them uh, to take advantage of these new housing units uh, that are coming online and specifically focus on equity. So those are some of the things that we're doing to really focus on spatial injustice in our city. That's great. Mayor Tubbs, it occurs to me that your gun violence initiative might have, might have spatial dimensions as well. Uh, the newest presidential initiative here at Michigan is about gun violence prevention. And so I think we'll be trying to understand what role urban planning plays in in understanding and preventing gun violence are you seeing a, a spatial side in your work well a hundred percent i think if you look at sort of the neighborhoods where gun violence happens in every city in this country they're the same neighborhoods that have been redlined they're the same neighborhoods with more liquor stores and grocery stores they're the same neighborhoods that are locked out of opportunity and lack access to transportation they're the same neighborhoods with terrible schools um they're the same neighborhoods with, with parks that are dilapidated etc um, so, so we approach gun violence in the city as, as symptomatic of deeper issues, particularly as Mayor life had said earlier with poverty. Um, so what we've been doing is a focusing on the less than one percent of our population that we know commit eighty percent of our gun crimes, and we also know that this population are both victims and perpetrators. That oftentimes these are folks reacting out of trauma and retaliatory gang, gun gang violence who have been shot at themselves or have had loved ones murdered and died. But we also understand that it's not enough just to focus on the focused deterrence and, and the violence interruption, but we have to be more preventative. So we're also going in sort of with our, our, our city teams to look at the neighborhoods and doing small things to create wins for those communities, whether it's a pothole that's been an issue for decades and showing the community like, oh, while we're get, addressing the, the gun violence issue in your, in your neighborhood, we know the issue isn't just gun violence. And we also know that everyone who lives in this neighborhood is not carrying a gun is not likely to be a victim or perpetrator of a violent crime. So I think to your point, Dean, all of this is so intersectional. And I think at the root of it, as you mentioned, it's just dealing with the legacy of white supremacy in this country and understanding there's not a single institution in this country that sees all humans as equal of value and equally worth and treat them with the same dignity. There's not one institution, as I like to tell my city, that treats black people as well as white people even in, in, in 2020. So we try to be as intentional as, as possible, but also understanding that city government is necessary, but not sufficient. That, that city government and mayors have a role, but a lot of these outcomes are, are issues of school districts, are, are, are issues of county governments, are issues of, of state and federal governments. But I think as we've seen on this panel, the power of mayors is to do what we can with the resources we have, but, but to also elevate issues of community importance. And I must say, as someone who grew up in poverty, as someone who's had family members murdered in, in my city, I'm so heartened to hear from other mayors who are making poverty an issue to address and something that's unacceptable in our cities, who are saying spatial segregation and, and opportunity um, correlating with zip code is unacceptable. It gives me, makes me actually much more hopeful um, today than I was um, during the latter part of last night while watching um, TV. <laughs> Yeah, that's good to hear. So um, I'm going to pivot now and start inviting in some of the audience questions that um, that my colleagues have been curating from the, the YouTube chat. And I, I see that Amina Khan has asked a question for the panelists. Here's some instructions for those of you who want to join in this conversation. Amina Khan has asked a question about 
And and a couple of you, Lori Lightfoot, you touched on this um, in your remarks. How do you how do you balance economic uh, rejuvenation with the challenge posed by gentrification and the risk of cultural erasure for important neighborhoods and communities of color and other uh, long established communities? Well, I'll go back to um, expand upon the point that I made earlier. Uh, we spend a significant amount of time with engagement um, in this Woodlawn neighborhood because there was a huge fear of exactly uh, the, the, the outcome that the question uh, posed. And really, I think there's no shortcut. You've got to engage with people. You've got to meet them where they are. You've got to have a very open mind about what they, what their needs are going to be. And I will tell you that every time we've done a kind of hyper local, local engagement, even um, those of us who really know the neighborhoods well, there's always a surprise. And the surprise is something that's articulated by the people in that neighborhood about what their needs are that weren't obvious, even from a lot of meaning decades long um, aspirations and engagement. So you've just got to do the hard work, roll up your sleeves, have the community meetings, talk to the stakeholders, make sure um, that you're really not just touching the loudest voices, because um, that's a mistake that um, you can easily make, but really drilling down, doing surveys, holding focus groups, and then really coming together with a set of um, options and then taking it back to the community to make sure you heard them well and you explain in detail okay we heard you say x here's what we think reflects x doesn't meet your needs and really working through it and and that takes time but that's the only way that i know on how you get it right and why that's important is i know from the work that i've done around a number of issues but particularly in the policing space the end product is important but the process and the journey is equally important. And if people don't feel like they've been heard and that you're not doing something with them that you say is for them, it will all be for naught. Thank you. Other thoughts about uh, mitigating gentrification and displacement? Uh, I'll jump in. You know, I'm really excited. We are really leaning in on the idea of cultural zoning to use our regulatory powers to actually preserve and incentivize uh, cultural, cultural uses and cultural preservation, particularly at the street level. Uh, we also are working on with the concept of cultural easements to give uh, control of land back to uh, the native people that originally uh, occupied the land in Oakland, which for us is the Ohlone people. Uh, and then finally, I want to lift up a programmatic piece that again is, is a silver, a COVID silver lining. Um, we have used FEMA reimbursement to address food insecurity to actually lift up what I call our, our restaurant culture keepers. Culture is not always, you know, an art gallery. Uh, I, I, particularly in a city as diverse as Oakland, are small, independently owned, owned by the BIPOC uh, owners. You know, these, these restaurants are total culture keepers. And so as we've used FEMA reimbursements, we've been very intentional in directing them to restaurants that that are owned by people of color, that provide culturally competent, uh, not just food, but gathering places. And uh, this program has helped keep in, uh, restaurant workers employed. It's kept really excellent food going out to our unsheltered communities, our seniors and COVID vulnerable population that get home meal delivery. Uh, it has just been such a win-win. And I've got to shout out World Central Kitchen and Jose um, Andres, the chef, uh, who has done the whole logistical back end to make this possible. We should not just be doing this during a pandemic, people. We should be doing this all the time. There is no reason for hunger to exist in American cities. And we can actually lift up and support those culture keepers uh, in our restaurant communities to actually end hunger. So uh, that, that is one of those things that we need to keep. So uh, Mayor Schaff, uh, or, or the other mayors in the, in the group, one of our audience members picked up on Mayor Schaff's uh, framing of a silver lining to the pandemic. 
Uh, do you, are there other examples of ways that this crisis has um, allowed you to adopt planning policies or public policies that you aim to make permanent? Um, I, I will jump in. Um, you know, look, I think the silver lining, I'll expand it. I think one of the, the most important things that mayors can do in this really difficult time is give people hope. Um, give them hope by being steady, give them hope by hearing and reflecting uh, what their needs are. I think that's critically um, important. One of the things that we did um, in trying to give hope um, and find a silver lining, when we saw that COVID-19 was impacting um, our black residents um, in deaths at seven times the rate of any other demographic, I mean, it's a breathtaking number because it's not just a statistic. You realize these are people who um, have lived difficult lives and are now really suffering. Not only them, with the loss of life, but their families, and that has a ripple effect across communities. So one of the things that we did in response to that horrible uh, um, disparate impact is form a racial equity rapid response team. And what it really is, is we connected up with um, local healthcare providers, community leaders, um, and um, put together um, an out extensive hyperlocal outreach um, to understand what was actually happening in these communities that were being most dramatically impacted by COVID-19. We started out really focusing on the areas in the city where we were seeing a high incidence of black deaths. Uh, we expanded that lens uh, to cover uh, the Latinx community. And as a result, what we found is incredible partnerships that have addressed everything, of course, from COVID-19 impact, but food, housing, and other disparities. We knew that these issues existed. We were working on them. <clears throat> but I guess the silver lining is that COVID-19 <clears throat> really compelled us to act much more with much more urgency, to bring more resources um, in a quicker time period, and really try to shrink these healthcare disparities that were uh, really challenging our response to COVID-19. So that is something, as I told my team throughout these, these multiple crises, I don't want to build temporary scaffolding around anything. I want to lay a foundation on which we can build um, for the future. And the racial equity rapid response team is just one of those efforts uh, that we've employed with great success um, here in Chicago. How about in Minneapolis or Stockton? Sure. I think it's first important to recognize that COVID-19 and these multiple crises that have been stacked upon one another, they didn't create these fault lines we're seeing, but they certainly exposed them in a big way. Uh, they exposed in a very visible fashion uh, the great discrepancies that we have between our, our white community and communities of color. They dispo exposed the discrepancies that we're seeing between different areas of the city, the allocations of funds that they get, their ability to get financing. Uh, and one of the things that I think we can learn going forward uh, is first how to first how to galvanize uh, some of the force that we see from the community. I mean, we've got all of this this anger and frustration. Uh, We've got really strong emotions right now that, that people are experiencing. And if, and if we can channel that emotion and that pain and that trauma towards several specific pieces, several specific policy initiatives that are well-placed, you know, we can really get a whole lot done here. And I think one of the biggest things is we're now moving past the everybody gets something stage. You know, this is not the all boats rise with the tide. You know, this right now is we need to make sure that the precision of our solutions match the precision of the harm that was initially inflicted. And that means that we're targeting resources. And we've done that in several different ways. Uh, one of them is we've made sure that the businesses, the small businesses that have been hit hardest by COVID-19, which tragically are the same small businesses that were hit hardest by the unrest, are the first to get some of the emergency assistance dollars. And yes, that does exclude certain areas of our city. It does exclude certain businesses and people from our city, but we have to pick 
and choose who's going to get the resources. And when you pick and choose, you need to figure out who needs it most. Secondly, there's some of these broader concepts like affordable housing. You know, in Minneapolis, everybody's for affordable housing at the macro level. But as soon as you start talking about putting it anywhere in the vicinity of where they live, there's suddenly pushback. Uh, and one of the conversations we've been having is let's not just be affordable housing as this sort of philosophical thing. Be for it when there is a project that is proposed in a middle and upper income neighborhood as well. Make sure that our policies are geared towards placing affordable housing in every area of the city. Make sure that we're entering these really difficult conversations, which with an eye, not just as Mayor Lightfoot said, putting up the scaffolding, but creating the foundation down the line. And I think we've really learned a whole lot of lessons. You know, I mean, over these last several months, you know, every single morning I, I wake up and I, I try and tell myself that this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity today to do things differently than we have in the past and do things better than we have in the past. And sometimes it's, it's a hard, it's a hard sort of lesson to take when things are so tough, uh, but it is necessary. Thank you. Mayor Tubbs, do you want to add to that or should we should carry, just carry on? on? Okay, so so Mayor Fry already alluded to this, uh, a topic that came up in a question from audience member Kyle Slug, which is how do we, you know, there are calls for systemic change um, in, you know, all across our society. How, as city leaders, do you harness that sense of crisis to drive policy changes that that may not have consensus that are that are politically challenging? Very <laughs> first, you don't always need full consensus to advocate for a position that you believe in. Uh, and I think it's necessary for leaders not just to drive towards consensus, but also at times lead. You know, when 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 we started pushing to get rid of all single family zoning or single family exclusive zoning, I'm quite certain that it did not have a majority of support in the city, uh, at least on its face. Uh, when you start advocating for affordable housing in a middle or an upper income neighborhood, it usually doesn't and often doesn't have a majority of support, at least in that particular neighborhood. Um, but I think what's happening right now is people have this sense of urgency to change. You know, they're looking back at the history from which we've come, the maps that I mentioned earlier, the systemic inequities and the redlining and the intentional segregation. And they're saying, all right, I understand that, you know, now you have to lean in a little bit more to perhaps an uncomfortable topic, even and especially when it makes you uncomfortable. And, you know, I, I've had to do that myself at times, uh, you know, areas where I perhaps don't have the, the, the background or the knowledge to fully understand some of this, these systemic issues that we're experiencing in our city. Um, I think it also means at times, you know, recognizing that some of the best ideas that I've got are not my ideas at all. Um, and, and making sure that we're galvanizing community to, to come up with these, those, those ideas. And we as, as bureaucrats, as elected officials, as, as public servants, are then charged with finding ways to put those ideas into into real strategies. And you know, Mayor Tubbs mentioned this at the very beginning with with guaranteed basic income. You know, these ideas are going back to King, um, and before that, um, these ideas were initially thought of by community, and then maybe an academic thereafter comes up with them, and then maybe thereafter down the road, a mayors start to say, "Let's do this." And thank you for leading the way. Um, uh, but you know, the, the the truth is, it ain't easy. Uh, it's hard. Um, and that's kind of what I appreciate about these city positions and and having the honor to serve as mayor. And I'm sure my colleagues on the on the call here feel similarly. These questions are all messy. They're difficult. It is rare that I walk into the office and there's something that is so unbelievably straightforward and non-controversial. And that's something that you kind of have to grow to appreciate and love even is operating in that space of uncomfortability. And let me just jump in and say something um, briefly. I think in terms of consensus, there's really two sort of guiding lights, um, at least I use. Um, number one, 
was when Dr. King said a leader is a molder of consensus. That if you're doing where the consensus is, you're not leading, right? Like at some point you have to stretch and get people to be where they are. And that's the art of leadership. And that's why we're lucky that we don't need 100% of the vote to be elected. We don't need 50.1. 49.9 could hate you. But if you got the 50.1, you're able to, to do as necessary. And then the second thing is really reckoning with whether the status quo is truly untenable. Because there's uh, many of things we've done in the city, whether it's the gun violence reduction work, whether it's the basic income work, whether it's to work and provide scholarships to students, whether it's to work to end the city subsidy of golf courses. All those things where I first said we were going to do them were met, met with intense backlash. I mean, I was almost recalled or people talked about doing a recall um, because I dared to say we shouldn't subsidize golf courses and we can be a safer city by investing directly in the young people committing gun violence. And But looking back over the last four years, the things I'm most proud of were those things where I had to push myself and push the community to come to consensus and doing so and talking in terms of our values and talking in terms of the status quo, the way things are, the way things are arranged, are at odds with who we want to be as a city. This is going to be difficult. This is going to be nasty. This won't feel good, but this is what's necessary. And then taking the heat, but make sure bringing people along, as Mayor Lightfoot said, on the journey. So they're part of that process of making change. And I found that to be some of the most difficult, but some of the most rewarding work and definitely the work that's required at this time where we're seeing just such grave disparities in, 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 on every single conceivable metric that really put, I, I would argue, our values at odds with the reality of the vast majority of our constituents. Thank you. Um, we, oh, go ahead. I was gonna, I was gonna jump in, if you, but if you wanna move yeah. on. I, I think one of the, um, this is a great question because it's really, I think, challenge all of us at some level. Um, what I try to do is spend time not reacting, but listening. Um, you know, I, I, I love my fellow mayors across the country. We all are living in different circumstances, but we're, what I've admired most is watching the mayors who don't feel compelled when the protest comes to jump out right away with a laundry list of blue ribbon solutions. I don't think that that's, where you get to the to the center and where you and I think as Mayor Tupsch just said really eloquently is really drive consensus. For me, I've kind of adapted the de-escalation uh, methods that we teach our police officers, which is time and distance. And for what it, what it really translates for me is really listening. Um, there are many times that I've thought of myself as kind of being in that eye of the storm where the where things are raging all around me and I just sit and I listen and I watch and I think about what the best path forward is and really try to pull out of the, the discussion and that's probably putting it very politely. Um, <laughs> what are the best ideas? Who are the people that really are forging towards solutions that are in it for the long haul um, and then work together to move forward? Um, you know, I think the other thing that I'll, I'll speak for myself, but the other thing that I have really pushed myself to ask is, why are you doing what you're doing and when you're doing it? And by that, I mean, as elected officials, and I hate the word politician, but we are what we are, you know, what are our motivations? Why are we making this particular call? Are we doing it because it's the right thing to do? Or are we doing it because it's a politically expedient thing to do? Now, no one can afford to be a purist, and I certainly am not saying that, but I feel like for myself, I have a lot of freedom because it's the first job I've ever run for, the last job I'm ever going to have, um, and it gives you a freedom to really think about what the right thing is, and it gives you, I think, a, a larger frame and range of options if you're not worried about your own electoral survival, which I am. I'm not going to say I, I don't. I think about it. I I'm, I'm obviously want to get reelected, but I'm 17 months in, and I've been through a hell of a lot in a really short period of time, as we all have. But as the mayor, you've really got to think about what your motivations are, and I do think about that. But I really focus on why did I run? Why did I want this job? Um, as many of my friends have said, why did you want that job? Um, 
but really focusing on delivery for the people who have never had a seat at any table of power. That's what I'm focused on. And sometimes that wins friends, sometimes it wins enemies. But when I stay centered in what my values are, then I know that I'm doing the right thing. Thank you. So we've gotten in the chat a number of questions. I'm, you know, as we as we move toward a conclusion here, uh, I think after last night's debate, a lot of us are mindful how close we are to the election and how much pressure there is on questions about the period after election night. Um, and uh, some people are expecting civil unrest in our cities. Others, I think, are pretty skeptical of the idea that our society and our cities are um, are at the brink of of those kinds of experiences. Um, so, so sort of pulling from the sentiment of some of those questions in the chat, I'd, I'd love to hear from our mayors um, what what you anticipate for uh, the latter part of November, you know, for, for November and beyond, um, and and how do you envision that uh, that period in your in your cities? I'm happy to start. I, I think you've got to deal with the realities on the ground. Um, people who are skeptical about civic unrest haven't been living in America for the last uh, five months. Um, and if you think about four years ago, um, after the election, there was a huge civic outcry, mostly peaceful, but a big outcry everywhere across the country. At a minimum, I think we have to we have an obligation to our residents to prepare for that. Um, unfortunately, given what we've seen and the clashes across the country, no matter what the outcome is, and I think it's highly likely that we will not know the outcome on the evening of November 3rd and maybe not even November 4th or the 5th, that uncertainty, that void is gonna be filled. And so again, you hope for the best, but I think you have to prepare for what each of us has seen happening in our cities over the course of the summer. And that is a civic outcry, hopefully peaceful, but given what I described earlier, what we've seen in Chicago, we've got to prepare uh, for violence. And I hate to say it that directly, uh, but we have been doing planning for weeks now. Uh, we're doing tabletop exercises, we'll be doing live drills. And I think it really, we have to think about it in kind of two big buckets. The one is making sure that we protect the integrity of the election process, that everybody who wants to vote in person on election day can vote in person safely and peacefully. And making sure that when those polls close, that the um, local board of election um, is protected, that those workers who are gonna be doing the hard and important work of counting those ballots can do so in an atmosphere free from fear or intimidation. So that's one tranche of, I think, what we've got to be prepared for. The second tranche is what happens once the polls close in our streets and the days thereafter and being ready. And candidly, we are preparing not just for the aftermath of the election, but through Inauguration Day. I'll tack on as well. You know, Mayor Lightfoot just mentioned at, at the end there the importance of not just planning for the election, but all the way through Inauguration Day. And that period of time will be essential for mayors and cities to be totally prepared. You know, the most foundational element perhaps of our democracy is this peaceful transition of power. Uh, and so that it, it should frighten the hell out of all of us when any candidate talks about not abiding by the result of the election itself, even hints at it. I mean, that, that peaceful transition of power is, is, is like the goes back to the very establishing of our democracy. Um, that's scary. You know, the second thing that's, that's scary that, that happened last night is just a, a, the refusal to denounce white supremacy. Uh, I did not know uh, before last night what the Proud Boys was as an organization. I had no idea. And I looked it up last night, and it is, according to Wikipedia, uh, Proud Boys is a far-right neo-fascist organization that admits only men as members and promotes and engages in violence. The promotion and engagement in violence in any form is wrong. 
Uh, and we should all be prepared and ready to call that out. And that's on election day. Uh, and that's also in the interim until the ultimate inauguration happens. Thank you. So um, thinking about uh, wrapping up shortly, let me ask all four of you, uh, just in a relatively quick round, what topics did we not touch on that are top of mind for you when you think about the longer term agenda that you'll be able to perhaps bring back to the fore uh, in a couple of months? <clears throat> I think one of the things that we kind of touched around the edges, but really not substantively, uh, is how we recover uh, from this catastrophic economic collapse. Um, in Chicago, our, our um, budget gap for 2020 is 800 million. And in 2020, we're looking at a deficit of 1.2 billion. And a lot of that um, is that certainly for 2020 and 65% of 2021 is directly related to COVID-19. And you. that is a reality um, on a scale, hopefully not as dramatic as Chicago, but I think that's a reality in cities all across the country, which makes the um, failure so far of the federal government, both the House and the Senate and the executive branch, to come up with a package of relief for cities and municipalities. And there's many more things that need to be added onto it. Um, really shameful. Um, if they leave uh, in recess and go to um, go to a home uh, to run for re-election without listening to the cries across the country in blue, red, purple um, cities, that is something that we can um, ignore and we have to hold them accountable. We need help. Our cities are crying out uh, for revenue loss um, and that is something that's going to critically shape the future of our cities for years to come. The time is now to act. What other topics are top of mind for you all that we didn't devote time to? I would say you did devote time to it, but never enough. The issue of structural racism, <laughs> it, it, we in America are deprived of the talent and efforts of huge swaths of our communities. And it is not an individual failing. It is a policy failing. It is a structural failing. Um, I, I commend you all to watch, in addition to Stockton on My Mind, which is a great documentary about the fabulous Mayor Tubbs. Uh, there's a new documentary coming out in a couple weeks called The Great American Lie that really lifts up how this we, we've created this narrative of the rugged individualist in America to distract people from recognizing that our leaders are failing to put in place policies that actually lift people up as opposed to preserve the economic status quo. And so the more attention that we can put on that, the dismantling of structural racism that will improve. I would add, um, Mayor Schaff mentioned this in the chat, but um, homelessness um, and, and, and housing insecurity, um, for sure. I think that topic number one, pre-COVID, um, still up there with the other topics that COVID has brought forward, but even, especially when these eviction moratoriums expire, especially when the rent is due, what are we gonna do with all the, all the folks who still don't have enough to make full payments? And what are we gonna do for all the folks who are homeless before COVID-19 and all the people who are even more even more economic precarious positions because of COVID-19 and, and, and how does that play um, in our cities is definitely going to be top issue 2021 for sure. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Uh, two issues. One of them, Mayor Tubbs covered already, which is which is homelessness. Uh, and you know, as you take a deeper magnifying glass to the issue, you find that such a large percentage of those who are experiencing homelessness and, by the way, unsheltered homelessness are working. They're working, but they don't have enough money to make up the gap between the cost of living outside or in a shelter and the cost of the deepest affordable housing that we have in the city. And so we collectively are perpetually keeping them as homeless. And that's immoral, um, but it's also financially really dumb because it costs like the city and the county and the state 
somewhere like three or four times uh, the amount to keep them on the streets as it does just to give them a home, just to get them a home. And so that takes effort, that takes money, that takes a whole lot of different jurisdictions work together, but it's a worthy goal because you don't get that. You can't possibly think about taking the next step if you don't have that stability to begin with. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> wrap up question, lightning round for all four of you. Um, over the past two years, mayors and former mayors from cities large and small have competed for the presidency and they've contended for the vice presidential nomination. So in a concluding lightning round, could we hear from each of you in one sentence, if possible, the principle of leadership that you will bring to your future term as our president? <laughs> I'll, I'll go. Never, ever, ever. Uh, I have the job, one job in public service that I want. Um, my, uh, I, I, I love my wife. Uh, she will throw my stuff out on the front lawn, um, change the locks on the door. Um, but in all seriousness, this is where it happens. Mayors are on the front line. We're making it done, get, getting it done. Uh, we're the place where um, the laboratory for great innovative ideas are happening. Um, what we need is a president who listens to us and brings us into the discussion. That's what we need. Yeah, I'll join Mayor Lightfoot in saying I have no interest in that job, but the reason that presidents should channel their inner mayor is because we actually live in our communities. We are, are touching and, and hugging and crying with our residents every day. And we do not have time for partisan deadlock. Listen, mayors belong to one political party. It's the party of get shit done. And that's what we need in a president. I'm not old enough to be president, thankfully. So, so to answer your question, um, in terms of one principle of leadership that I'll bring to my future second term as mayor, it's really the, this, this understanding that government has to work for everyone. And that government at its best reflects the universal basic dignity that all people had and that and, and, and works accordingly. I'll echo everything that everyone else has just said. Uh, you know, I, I ran for mayor because I wanted to be mayor. Um, I mean, from the very first days that I knew that I was interested in being involved in politics, uh, I knew that I wanted to be mayor of Minneapolis because you get to do that tough work. You get to work hand in hand with community. And by the way, at the mayoral level, at the city level, you really can't lie about stuff. You know, if somebody calls in and says, you know, hey, I need the pot, this pothole outside my home filled, you can't pretend it's filled when it's not. It, it's either there, it's been filled, or it hasn't. Um, and so there's that kind of requirement of honesty, which I think people uh, appreciate at the end. And, you know, Mayor, Mayor Carter always talks about how, you know, the because the, the when you think about the things that, that that make you feel good and the, the big philosophical ideas and the goals and visions, you know, that's that's the federal government. When you think about the things that really piss you off, that's mayor. Uh, and we're in that every single day. And that's where where I want to be. Thank you to all three of you. Mayor Tubbs had to scoot to his next um, appointment. But um, echoing some of the comments that are coming through on YouTube, thank you so much, uh, mayors, for this, your leadership and for sharing with us today some of what you're doing and thinking. This is the kind of conversation our constituents, I think, want from our elected officials. So on behalf of everyone at the University of Michigan, thank you for joining us today and please keep up the amazing work. Take care.